Hi, everybody. This is Gerald Rollies, and I'm coming from the Natural Health Improvement Center of Idaho. And today we're going to talk about the six barriers to healing, right? So what prevents people from actually healing? And there's six common things that almost everybody is exposed to in the environment or is dealing with that has to be overcome in order for proper healing and restoration to take place. And the first one is scars. Okay. So scars, I actually have another posting on our website, nhicidaho.com about scars. And I have a separate video. You can look at that, but the short gist of scars is that we have Chinese traditional Chinese medicine has these meridians that are essentially think of your nervous system on your skin, right? Your skin is the largest organ. And you have these meridians that run all throughout the body. Sometimes it's almost circular. And there's this concept of energy or in Chinese qi. So um, I'm half Chinese. I've studied the language and Chinese medicine to a certain degree, but there's this concept, there's energy that's flowing along these Chinese meridians. And if the flow is not sufficient, then it actually prevents healing from taking place. That's one of the reasons why acupuncture works amazing. Now, if you don't have an acupuncturist, you can receive acupressure, which is similar. It takes a little bit longer, a little bit more sessions, but acupressure is working along the same points of these traditional Chinese meridians that run along the body. If there is a scar that actually runs along the meridian, then it severs or halts the flow of the energy. So it prevents it from going up and down. And you can still benefit from acupuncture or acupressure. But if you have your scars thoroughly addressed, then the acupuncture and acupressure will work even better better, even more amazing. And I regularly receive acupuncture from my colleagues. And I know I recommend it to all our patients that we see here too, as well. And so the scars have to be addressed now and a scar can result from a previous surgery. So some sort of incision or even just like a piercing of the skin. So oftentimes a laparoscopic procedure where they poke three holes in through the skin to provide, to, to perform the surgery. That's enough to cause a scar. Scars can also develop from piercings, So ear piercings, there's a lot of acupuncture points along the ears that are, you know, unfortunately hit, or they actually form a scar that hasn't thoroughly healed. And you'll know if you're an individual that has a piercing of some sort, and there was a particular piercing that actually remained irritated for an extended period of time, or constantly you place different types of uh, of rings within that piercing, and it's always irritated. Just know that that potentially is a scar that hasn't healed thoroughly and needs to be addressed. Okay. So, um, also not only piercings, surgeries, but tattoos. Tattoos are micro scarring taking place. And so, for many people who come into the clinic and they have a particular tattoo that they notice didn't heal right away or remain inflamed for a much larger, longer period of time, that's usually a scar that hasn't healed 100%. And it may be lying a meridian where the energy is not flowing up and down appropriately. Okay, so looking at scars is key to number one. The second one is heavy metals. Heavy metals is an issue, right? There's heavy metals in our water, our food, our air. Sometimes it's things that may get injected into our bodies. There's heavy metals. And so we have to just be aware of which heavy metals. Sometimes it's actually um, in our antiperspirants, there's aluminum. And we know that aluminum is linked to certain cognitive decline, as well as increased risk of breast cancers. We know that there's mercury in our environment, right? There's coal burning. Coal burning just puts mercury and various heavy metals into the air. There's lead in our air because the gasoline, our vehicles actually run off of is unleaded. However, the gasoline in airplanes is leaded. So we're having that lead actually enter our atmosphere, not only from plane exhaust, but many other sources. Um, and so heavy metals are an issue, and especially if they get into our bodies. Now we have to figure out how to get it out of our body. And there's always specific nutritional and herbal support um, that can help anybody. And, and it's never one size fits all. We provide customized design clinical nutrition programs specific to each individual. So it depends on what is an issue, right? And there's other heavy metals involved. Copper can be a heavy metal. Zinc oxide is, is a form of zinc that's not quite well accepted by the body or used. So that can eventually build up and become problematic. So there's different other, uh, we call them, now zinc is a mineral, but there's toxic forms of minerals, right? There's organically bound minerals and or, inorganically bound minerals. And I have another video on that somewhere, but heavy metals are key. And then of course, we know chemicals. Uh, we know that pesticides are dangerous. If you actually purchase, you know, a, a gallon of a particular pesticide, and it's going to say keep away from children, do not ingest, call poison control, etc. They have all of these warnings. And chemicals are in our environment. They're in our air. They're in 
our foods, unfortunately, especially those with preservatives and synthetic pesticides and synthetic fertilizers that have been used in our food. So they're in our supply. And so it can be problematic if there are chemicals in the body. I work with uh, mechanics who come in and have breathed in or have applied certain substances on their hands. And these chemicals can get in the body. I've worked with individuals who have worked around uh, jets and jet fuels. Um, I've worked around individuals who do a lot of welding, right? So there's a lot of chemicals in our environment. We just cannot avoid them, but they have to be addressed if they're causing problems within our bodies. The next category is biotoxins. And we talk about immune challenges. And immune challenges, we have bacteria, viruses, parasites, and molds, also known as funguses, okay, or fungi. And the that is indicative that the immune system might be weak and we have to strengthen it accordingly. And of course, depending on which pathogen or which biotoxin is actually growing and thriving within your body, it has to be addressed so that your body can actually start to heal and recover. And the next is food sensitivity. So um, there's a lot of foods. There's a lot of modification that's being done to our foods. It's been, they've been genetically engineered, genetically modified. They've been highly refined, homogenized, processed. They've been made to last forever on the grocery stores because you want to, you know, a food manufacturer wants to generate a large margin and they wouldn't want to create foods that actually spoil on the shelves. And so they're going to do whatever they can to do to make sure it lives as long as possible. And one of the elements that is done during the processing of foods is the elimination of the enzymes, the raw enzymes, the living enzymes, the actual, the actual living part of the food, unfortunately, that our body needs, but it's been removed so that the food doesn't start to decompose while it's sitting on the shelf waiting for the purchaser or the consumer to come and acquire that product. Okay, so we have to address foods. Um, so the food is the food supply is not the same that it used to be 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 years ago. And not only that, people or individuals have now developed sensitivities or have remained on a diet that doesn't resemble what we did as uh, natives, right? As uh, an ancestral diet, an ancestral diet, a hunter gatherer diet, you would actually eat foods you would hunt or kill or gather in that season. Right. So um, nowadays, most people are eating oftentimes the same thing on a regular basis. And it's the same foods where it's depleted in certain nutrients and certain things start to build up or accumulate. I'll give you an example. Oftentimes, these sugar substitutes that are being consumed in place of sugar, right? So we know that too much sugar can be problematic, can raise um, blood glucose levels and lead to all kinds of metabolic related issues. And so then some individuals may go to a xylitol or a monk fruit or a stevia extract. And the problem is, is that then every foods that are consumed using this um, isolated, keep in mind it's an isolate. So just similar to sugar, sugar is isolated, refined sugar is isolated. It's been removed from the sugar cane where all these other nutrients that once accompanied the sugar molecule is, has now been removed and sugar as, an, as a concentrate can be hugely problematic. Um, Dr. Weston and Price studied the natives and found that when they just ate sugar cane, the whole thing, it was not a problem. But when we eat the refined isolate, then it becomes an issue. And that can also apply to stevia. So many, of, many individuals have never, uh, sometimes they'll come in and I'll find that there's some stevia accumulation that's creating challenges. And it's the stevia plant that people should be eating and mixing. So if you've never had it, if, if you've had a leaf before or chewed on a stevia plant leaf, like this video or put it in the comments what it's like. But I remember when I had a stevia leaf, I chewed on it. It was extremely sweet. But nowadays what people are adding to the recipes are a stevia extract of that, um, that phytonutrient that actually causes sweetness. And that is known to accumulate uh, significantly in the body if consumed too much. Okay, so anyways, foods can be an issue. Sometimes people can develop a food sensitivity, food allergy, and there are specific tests we use or we recommend. So there's blood, there's saliva, and there's... Um, and we're going to be looking at IgE, IgG, sometimes IgA. So there's many tests that we can do that with. Uh, and then nutrient deficiencies. So if anybody has ever eaten a processed food, there's certain nutrients that we're missing. And then the body has to deal with half the food, right? Uh, so poor, poor nutrition, malnutrition is an issue that uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can eat and be full and still be okay nutrition wise. It's like if people ate 
processed refined foods for an extended period of time, there's going to be huge gaps missing. So nutrient deficiency needs to be addressed. All right. And this is what we do. Um, if we have here, this, this is a flyer we have in our clinic and it's just simply right here. People can actually click on it. You can put your phone onto here and this is a QR code and it'll take you to our online store for specific labs. And it's made available for any individual who's looking to improve their health and furthermore, investigate the root causes to your health challenges, right? So these six barriers to healing have to be addressed in order for everyone to be healthy and happy. And that's what our mission is here at the Natural Health Improvement Center is to help as many people be healthy and happy, um, starting with parents, because we want all parents to be the best parents they can possibly be to their kids. And then we want all kids to also have the best nutrition so that they can reach their full potential in life. So anyways, if you have any questions about the six barriers of healing, if you think you're dealing with any one of those, or maybe two or three or all six, we're here to help out. All right. Hope you're having a good day. Looking forward to seeing you soon.